Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Wendy Rose Williams. Wendy is a past life adventure guide. She helps people release energy that no longer serves them so they can lead a happier, healthier life filled with purpose. Examples of energy that don't serve us include pain and anxiety and depression. Wendy is a certified spiritual teacher and Reiki master energy healer as well as a hypnotherapist specializing in past life regression. She trained with Dr. Brian Weiss, Many Lives, Many Masters. Wendy is a published author who enjoys voicing her own audiobooks. So often when we've been betrayed, we feel like we're crazy and like we're alone. We're not. There's so much to unpack and heal from. And when we don't, we keep repeating these hard relationships until we get the message that we're worthy, deserving, we need stronger boundaries in place, or whatever the particular lesson is for us. My next guest Wendy Rose Williams had a few of those relationships and learned so much about boundaries, love, and responsibility in the process. You're going to love this conversation. Here's Wendy. Okay, everybody, we have Wendy Rose Williams with us today. And, you know, we just spoke a little bit before I hit record, and we are in for a very powerful conversation. She's going to be talking about how do you break through for, from multiple betrayals. And she has a very interesting story to share. And of course, we're always interested in what we do with that story. So, welcome, Wendy. Well, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, excited to excited to have you chat with us today because, you know, I, I always want to, I try to get in the minds of my listeners and say, what what is it that they would really appreciate learning? And, and for me, it's always, yes, we have these experiences, we have these traumas, but what do we do with them and how could it lead us to something better? But let's start with, let's start with the trauma. Let's start with the, with the betrayal and the experience. Can you share your story? Sure. Uh, well, what, what occurred for me was I started dating uh, my first boyfriend when I was 15, so high school. And, you know, you've just got that, that tender heart. It's that first, first relationship. And I'm a very romantic soul, so really cared about it a lot. And we were together for five years, so well into uh, my, my college. I was getting ready to, to graduate from college. And what I discovered, unfortunately, um, along the way was he was having um, an affair um, with um, one of my closest female relatives. And that was just absolutely devastating. And looking back on it, I just wish I had taken better care of myself and I wish I had ended the relationship um, when I discovered that fact, but I didn't. And I think that really uh, cost me a lot. I think that cost me a lot in self-confidence and self-esteem. And I think it just was a very, very unhealthy relationship. And, and, and I want to get to all that it led to, but let's just back up. So here you, you have this relationship and mm -hmm. then your boyfriend has an affair with a, a close relative of yours. Mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you manage that? What did, because that's, you know, it's like a double betrayal. Exactly, exactly. Because it was the two people that were so close to me. And it just it really was it really was a double betrayal. And it just what what happened was I started to suspect something was was wrong and that it, it was pretty unthinkable to consider. Um, so it took a while to wrap my head around, but I kept seeing more and more odd signs of what was going on. So I um, spoke with him um, first and separately, and he at first um, denied it um, and then tried to um, kind of trivialize it um, and you know, say that it was not that big a deal um, and that he was sorry and let's just move on type of thing. And that really uh, was not sufficient. Again, I was not standing up for me um, in an appropriate and appropriate way. And when I confronted um, the other individual, um, she completely uh, just deflected it. No apology, wouldn't take any responsibility and just said, uh, no big deal, uh, go find yourself a new guy. 
Wow. And so what did, what did you do with that information? Because here's the, you know, I we have that in, down. Yeah, I was going to say, we are, intuitively, we know that just does not feel right. That doesn't sit right. I don't, yeah. I don't, you know, and, and yeah, we're supposed really. to just move on and just be like, okay with that, which is right. Exactly. So just really, I really, really shut down and I became very uh, physically ill um, as a yeah. result and was in, in um, bed for several months. And here I am in my, you know, senior year of high school, and this is supposed to be a wonderful time. And I also was doing both my senior year in high school and my first year in college. Mm -hmm. So this really heavy academic load and so looking forward to going away to college and just, you know, so expecting it to be, you know, this really fantastic year um, in so many ways um, with that culmination of high school. And instead, um, this is the mess I was in. And it's so common at, to experience physical, mental, and emotional symptoms with betrayal. I mean, so much so that one of the three discoveries in my study was that there is this collection of symptoms now known as post-betrayal syndrome. What were some of the symptoms that you had, the physical, mental, and emotional symptoms? Um, I just felt uh, very alone. Um, I felt ashamed. I felt embarrassed. I felt not enough. Mm -hmm. um, I felt crazy at times because I really knew that the affair was continuing, yet they both were at the point of denying it. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it just, I just, I didn't know what to do with it. Um, mm -hmm. In hindsight, again, I was only 17 years old. Right. Uh, in hindsight, what I should have done was to have just completely ended the relationship and contact with him. Mm -hmm. And also to have considered um, doing so with with that female relative. Yeah, I think that would have been the healthiest for me. I also should have sought counseling. Mm -hmm. And that just didn't even enter my mind. Um, this was 1979. Right. <laughs> there we was get... not nearly as much um, yeah. you know, wonderful counseling and healing available. Um, so yeah, I just I just um, internalized it. You internalize it, which is so yeah. common. And what about some physical symptoms? Do you remember some physical symptoms? The that physical symptoms were just feeling kicked in the gut. Oh, that's, um, that's the you one. know, it just that was that was the biggest. I mean, yes, the broken heart, but I could I, I more felt it um, in my in my stomach, in my gut. The betrayal um, really sat there mm -hmm. um, in me, um, you know, just very heavily and just. Um, just that weight on your shoulders of, mm -hmm. you know, things not being right and not knowing how to resolve it. Yeah. So here you are, you're 17, you know, this isn't right. Your body's mm -hmm. telling you it's not right. And you're sort of caught up in this web of, but I trusted these people and here they are uh, denying and deflecting mm -hmm. and everything else. Mm -hmm. How did you move through it? What did you do? I moved through it in the, the best way I could was to just concentrate on uh, focusing on college. Um, you know, did, did my, my, my best to keep my grades up um, through high school. And I, as I said, I had missed literally several months of school because um, I was so sick in bed with mono um, and it was just a really severe case of exhaustion and yeah. mono um, and you know taking steroids and just not not feeling well um, so just kept kind of putting one foot in front of the other and it's like okay well, we're just going to focus on going to college um, but again, I didn't, I didn't break the relationship off. I went to college locally. Um, mm -hmm. So in a way, it's, it's a shame that I didn't go out of state. Um, and, but, and you, you know. Yeah, and this is so common. I mean, here's where, so th the mind and the body are responding, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and your emotions are letting you know something is clearly not right. The body is saying, okay, you know what, by the time it manifests physically, there's a lot going on mentally and emotionally. And, yes. and it hits the weakest link. And for you, it was mono, mm -hmm. you know, and that's it. And then your immune system just takes a nosedive completely. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, you're, you're less resistant to, to things that you'd normally be uh, more resistant to. And you're in the relationship. So it's not like you're not completely dis, you know, you're still tangled in this yes. web of, of destruction here. Um, but you were still moving forward with school and, and doing what you had to do. At what point did you start feeling better or, or sort of making different it decisions? Took, or 
It took about a year to physically feel better um, because, as I said, I started college here. I am a, a 17 year old, uh, you know, early, early entry and just this really heavy academic load. Mm -hmm. So it just was, um, it just was a big adjustment to college. Um, and I lived at home um, the first year, which was very unpleasant. Mm -hmm. um, and then by the next year made the decision, I just don't care what it's going to cost and how much, um, you know, that there's going to be some debt run up. I need to get out of this house, Okay. Um, you know, and just make a change to make a, a cleaner break with my life to more, more start over. So started kind of disentangling there. And I did feel a lot better um, once I moved into the college, college housing. Um, and I did that for, um, for two years. And then I moved on and got a first apartment um, with some other students because um, I went on straight on to my master's. So, so what was really the, yeah, what was the difference you noticed when you, when you moved? Because very often it does take that physical distance to create that space, the, the, enough of a space that we can start to heal. Did you notice a difference in how I did? I started to feel more free. I started to mm -hmm. feel more like myself again. I started to feel like a weight coming off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, I just started to feel like my, my, you know, stomach was starting to unclench and, mm -hmm. you know, was making a lot of friends in college and having good, good experiences and good successes there. Um, found a new new part-time job um, that really really suited me and was a great blessing for a couple of years of college yeah and so things started to go on an, on an uptick and that over time gave me you know the strength to say gosh I deserve better than this this just really not healthy not happy relationship it's not going to change Mm -hmm. He's not going to change. The other person's not going to change. Mm -hmm. The only person that can change in this is me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just started to, um, you know, realize it's time to end this, this relationship with him. So okay. I did. So you ended the relationship. So you were in college, you ended the relationship. And mm -hmm. did that lead to more, more growth or healing for you? That did. That, that was just a game changer. Um, and, you know, just started to, um, really enjoy, enjoy life again, um, started to, to date other men, you know, had a lot of fun with my, my um, housemates and mm -hmm. just, um, just, you know, just building a healthier, happier life for me. And I, I hope that, that the listeners and viewers are, are right now saying to themselves, you know, how do I feel based on this experience, based on this relationship that I'm in? And you're, here you are explaining an unhealthy relationship and how you're physically, mentally, and emotionally feeling. And then you end that unhealthy relationship and you see the difference in how you feel physically, mentally, and emotionally. So it is so obvious when we are uh, not in a relationship that serves. And it is so obvious when we are. Of course, every relationship has its issues, but clearly this was one that was uh, meant to teach you something valuable. And Absolutely. I really feel it was meant to teach me to have much better boundaries. Mm -hmm. And it took me a couple more relationships to learn that fully, yeah. but to put me first and to just really love and respect myself, because mm -hmm. uh, that was not being exhibited by my behavior of staying in um, you know, those relationships. And, and, you know, I love that you're bringing that up because I say this all the time. We keep getting opportunities in the name of the same type of relationships to teach us we are lovable, worthy, deserving. We do need stronger boundaries in place, whatever our particular lesson is. And until and unless we learn that, we will have experience after experience until we get the mother of all experiences. And we say, you know what? That's it. I'm never doing this again or that again. Lesson learned. We don't have to keep repeating it. So it sounds like you kept repeating uh, a similar pattern because it was very familiar to you until those boundaries were in place and you learned that lesson. So what, what happened next? Uh, what happened next was I married when I was 28 years old and there were, um, you know, certainly some fine qualities um, in my former husband because we, we divorced 15 years later. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I just, I had some, I, I went into it not, uh, 
I went into it with concerns. I guess that's just the best way to, to express it. Mm -hmm. Um, and just that, that's not a great way to enter a marriage. You know, I don't think that was very fair to, um, him or to me. It, it kind of was like a settling type. Yeah. So you knew at the time you you felt that you were settling at the time or you, you had reservations. I, did. I, I, I loved him. I saw the good qualities. Mm. Um, but I also had a sense of settling. Mm. Um, but I really felt we were meant to marry. And it also was the time period. There was this absolutely dreadful um, article that came out. I can't remember if it was Time or Newsweek mm-hmm. that has sh- been shown to be a flawed study. And it's also shown to have, have absolutely freaked out an entire generation of women. And it talked about women over 30 having a better chance of being um, kidnapped or by a terrorist, something like that, mm-hmm. than of getting married. Oh my gosh. And it was just absolutely ridiculous. But here it made the cover of Time or Newsweek on this flawed study. And I just was the age where um, I think a lot of us were kind of starting to panic of, oh my goodness, you know, I really want to marry and have the happy marriage and have the children and just have all those good things in life. And it doesn't seem to be happening for me. All I do is go to friends' weddings. Mm. So that's where that feeling of a little bit of settling came in. Wow. Okay. Isn't that interesting? So here it was, it was this flawed study it was that, mass media. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. That's so interesting. And so you, you, th- that sent the panic. Yes. In you <laughs> and you said, okay, I better grab the first one that comes along or you loved him, but it wasn't uh, the perfect fit for you. So what lessons did you learn from that experience? I learned I cannot be in relationship with someone where there is not excellent communication because I'm an expressive Mm. And that's something that I really crave and and need in relationship. And he was very um, high IQ, but very introverted, very uh, just, you know, software engineer, very just turned within Mm. and just did not um, want that much um, quality time together, (laughs) which is my primary love language. Right. And isn't it amazing? I I really feel like the more I learn about uh, all of this, that as you enter into a relationship past a few dates and you're getting a little bit serious, whatever it is, everybody should either know everybody's love language, take a disc assessment, some sort of, you know, we do this with companies, the assessment to see what role someone is best placed in. And it's almost like, why don't we do that in relationships? We really should. Exactly. Right. I hadn't discovered Gary Chapman's uh, five love languages until after we divorced. Mm -hmm. And I really wished I had found it during the marriage because he spoke gifts that to him, you know, giving gifts was just, just what he felt should make me feel loved. And that is my absolute dead last place. (laughs) I just really loved the quality time together because of the, you know, the communication and the expression. And I really appreciated the acts of service and that just was not um, on his radar. I appreciate the affection and we just, we were just, were really, really backwards. Mm -hmm. And here I wasn't serving this poor man well either um, because he was feeling like, where's the gifts, you know, where's the cards, where's the words of affirmation. But because those were dead last for me, I'm trying to get him to speak my language and he's trying to get me to speak his, but we don't, we don't know what the disconnect is. Yeah. And for those who aren't familiar with the book, it's Gary Chapman's The Five uh, Love Languages. It's just a brilliant book. It so, is. Yeah. I'm going to make sure I, I add a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> okay. So then what happened next? So you got out of that relationship. You got yes. out of that marriage. So we, we divorced and oh. I really went within in a great healthy way. I had two years young children. Our daughters were only six and eight. And we worked, I'm very proud of my former husband and I, because we said we're going to be peaceful. Mm. Uh, We are going to be just the best co-parents we can be so that the kids don't take it on the chops. Mm -hmm. So we just worked really, really hard to keep as many things the same for them as possible and went through a lot of work um, to make sure that that happened and that they weren't too um, discombobulated by living in two households. Mm. Um, so, you know, we just were really, really careful with that. 
And I think- Which is so I, wonderful because the kids take the hit so often. Exactly, exactly. So I think um, we both really grew up and really just, you know, stepped to the plate there in our 40s mm -hmm. of making it um, be as, as good as it could be for them. And I really reinvented my career. I moved into a new position, a new, a new job at a new company because I got laid off uh, right as I was going through divorce. Um, I was literally um, purchasing uh, a, new, a new home for the first time after the divorce and got laid off on that exact day. Oh, wow. <laughs> So Why that not, was, right? <laughs> that, that was interesting. It's yeah. like, well, but you know, if you're going to have that perfect storm, it's, it's the perfect place to, to get out of that, um, you know, that victim or martyr or depressed place that we can fall into and just get out of that. Why is this happening to me? Mm -hmm. And shifting it to why is this happening for me? And that change, that switch alone that, is gigantic. That changes everything. And, and it's also the, the why is this happening to me? I believe uh, so many people stay there for life and Correct. they just solidify themselves in that place that becomes their identity and you know we never want to be without an identity so we just stay there and and that's just the way it is how did you make that shift because i find you I, know it's it's um it's probably in in my community one of the hardest places to leave that mm -hmm. place of you know your your victim story and all the small self benefits you get from being there to saying even though i'm getting all these the benefits and the story and everything that goes along with it, the sympathy and everything. There's something so much better for me if I let that go. It's Absolutely. a huge distinction. So how did you do that? I made that shift because it's really, it's shirking responsibility. It's not being responsible for your life and your own mm -hmm. happiness. Cause that's mm -hmm. got to come from within you. Uh, Jerry Maguire had it dead wrong. You know, you do not complete me. There's no one <laughs> Completely. That makes me crazy. I say that all the time. I mean, what is that? You're just a half and best case scenario. You meet up with someone that makes your whole, well, what happens if something goes wrong? You're, exactly. You're half again? Exactly. I don't subscribe so that, to that either. That strength has got to come from within. So what happened was it was about six years um, after my divorce. And I had uh, at that point had built a new home. The career was going well. The kids were now 12 and 14 and, you know, just, just doing really well. And it was at the point where it's like, okay, I am ready to meet a nice guy. So how in the world does someone do that? So I asked younger girlfriends, cause they're a great source for that. Yeah. <laughs> and cause I hadn't been on a date in 25 years. What did I know? And I asked, I asked girlfriends and they said, oh, you need to go on match.com. And I'm like, what's match.com? So uh, friends helped me put together a profile and I met um, an amazing man and it absolutely shifted my world and allowed me to start to move into that place of power uh, through the experiences that he and I had because I woke up spiritually I was not expecting that and I just was not on my radar and what I discovered was he just had what I would refer to um, as the soul contract to wake me up mm -hmm. and we discovered um, many many lives together and through sorting all that out I also discovered he had um, what I would consider the soul contract to break my heart repeatedly until I stood in my power fully without abusing it. And that's where finally I started to really do the work um, about 10 years ago. When he and, and I, and I yes, and I want to just, I want to back up a little bit because of people course. may be thinking what, what the heck is a, <laughs> a soul contract and what are you talking about and why on earth would you be with Let's someone like that? that please yeah and and here's here's the thing and i and i would love your definition of it too but what i've learned and experienced myself is everybody comes into our lives for a specific reason and you yes. know you may have heard they come in for a season or a reason or a lifetime right and it's these opportunities uh, that we have through these relationships to learn a powerful lesson we're meant to learn. Mm -hmm. And when we don't realize that, we can look at these people and say, you know, 
am I just the poster child for abuse or betrayal or whatever the reason is, but they're coming into her. And I remember learning about this through, I loved how he put it. It was, um, oh my, Colin Tipping. And it was, um, oh, what was his book? Oh my goodness. It was forgive something about forgiveness, radical forgiveness. Okay. It's a beautiful book. And he's explaining how these people that we would normally be so angry at because they do things that are hurtful, harmful, hateful, but they're doing it for our benefit. So we learn all the lessons we need to learn. And the way he expressed it was just magnificent. But the soul contract, uh, because I know when, when I had a soul contract and I thought that was the craziest thing ever. And I just recommend that everybody just have an open mind because this stuff can sound woo-woo-ish, uh, but just consider what if it's true? Because I know I was just like you, so whoever is listening to this saying, that just sounds full-blown crazy. But, but when, you, when you are willing, and willingness is always the biggest word I use, willingness can take you into a million different wonderful places. When you're willing to consider just because I don't understand something, what if it is true? What if there's just more to learn? Uh, just because I don't see it doesn't mean it's not true. I know that has that has helped me in countless ways. So let's go with the whole, the, well, let's start with the soul contract idea. And when you say this was a soul contract and, and how did sure. you know that? And, and how did, how did you what, believe that? What happened was he mentioned in his dating profile that he was very interested in meeting a woman on a spiritual path, uh, particularly someone interested in a quote LBL. So I Googled it because I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to make sure this isn't some weird drug reference. <laughs> yeah, what is LBL? Exactly. It stands for Life Between Lives, which is Dr. Michael Newton Journey of Souls. It is a four hour spiritual regression where you're in this lovely, relaxed state doing a past life regression that actually takes you back to home, back to the light, back to heaven, whatever your belief system is, nirvana, whatever your belief is, but you don't have a body and you're there as an eternal soul and you're able to start to discover why am i really here you know what's my life purpose what am i here to learn mm -hmm. because when you look at those quote bad relationships or painful relationships if you're smart enough to look and go oh my goodness there's been several like this i thought they were going to be different but there's really the same thing showing up now i have to question what's the common denominator well I'm the only common denominator through it. So what do I need to learn? Mm -hmm. And what does my soul want to know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how am I going to learn it in the most um, beneficial way? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I just believe a, a soul contract is an agreement. It's an agreement that you make with someone because he and I, the minute we met, so he introduces me to Journey of Souls and then through trying to sync up schedules to meet for the first time to have lunch, um, I had enough time to read the book. And the reason he had put that reference in was he was getting ready to go for his own second Life Between Lives session. Mm -hmm. So that's why that was really on his radar. But the moment I read that book, um, and what it is in Journey of Souls, Dr. Newton describes over his 30 plus year career, the most interesting past life regression sessions and life between lives sessions that he facilitated mm -hmm. um, as a therapist. And he was flabbergasted because he'd never planned to do past life regression. He thought it was woo woo and weird, but a patient spontaneously went there when he asked her to go back to the source of her loneliness and her depression, because mm -hmm. they just hadn't been able to solve it. And she went all the way back home to where she was as a soul and she said, oh my goodness, I incarnated this lifetime and I don't have any of my friends here. I don't have any of my soul family here. Um, I'm feeling really lonely and I just don't know what to do. But as they explored it, she said, oh, oh my gosh, I made that choice. Mm. I'm not a victim. This isn't happening to me. I did that to learn how to be more independent and more resilient. 
-hmm. and how to make new friends and new relationships. So that shifted it for her. And she did not have the issue anymore because they'd gone back to the source of it, to that lifetime of origin and understood why. Yeah, it's all about learning and growth. So then what happened? What did you... So what happened was he and I knew, I mean, the minute we read each other's profiles before we even met, because it took us about three weeks to meet, um, to sync schedules, because he was traveling, I was busy, whatever, you know, real, real life's going on. Mm -hmm. But we both kept, um, you know, emailing or texting or phoning before we met saying, where do I know you from? Mm. Because we were trying to figure it out. But when we met in person, it just, I just looked in his eyes, and he looked in mine. And it's like, we know each other from a really, really long time ago. Mm. And it just, it just started to break down my barriers. Cause if you had asked me in 2010, do you believe in reincarnation and past lives? Do you believe in soul contracts? I would have said, what are you talking about? (laughs) I would have had zero frame of reference. I would have said, Hey, I'm an MBA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just don't know what you're talking about. What language is this? Right. And it's uh, because it does, it sounds so crazy until it makes, until you, you, you consider the possibility and then it can make sense for you. Exactly. Yeah. So then you're in this relationship and you're learning a ton of lessons and what happened? Uh, We were together for a little over a year, um, monogamous relationship, um, but he, he was not happy. I mean, there were many wonderful things that happened, a lot of things we learned together. It was, in some ways, it was the most delightful, um, just fantastic relationship I'd ever had because the communication was so amazing Mm -hmm. and we just had so much fun together. Um, but there was also a lot of uh, weirdness to it. Mm-hmm. Um, again, another not healthy relationship um, because he was one foot in, one foot out. Mm-hmm. Um, and just um, in my mind, it's committed. In my mind, um, you know, but I'm trying to force what I want onto it. Mm-hmm. And it's just not suiting him. So he ended it um, at, at 13 months Okay. which just so uh, broke my heart. Um, but it was the biggest gift to me. <laughs> mm. so Absolutely what was, the biggest yes. gift. So what was the, the lesson you learned from all of these experiences? The lesson I learned from that was do not give your heart away. Um, love yourself first. Take care of yourself first. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't deserve to be with a super selfish guy. Mm -hmm. Um, who just was not giving me enough, I would call it a crumbs from the table um, relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, It was uh, another food analogy here. It was, he was trying to have his cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. And I do appreciate his honesty that when he ended the relationship, which by the way, he did via email. Mm. Lovely. (laughs) Um, It was just have he just wanted to have his cake and eat it too and just you know have this great relationship with me that I think was really feeding his ego but he just the flirting with other people right in front of my face was absolutely horrible and I called him out on it multiple times and said that's disrespectful do not do that that does not work for me that really hurts my feelings um and it's just it's just no don't do it right and would not stop doing it. Yeah. Um, so, so then, you know what, there's, there's so many things that, that I learned even from this conversation, which is we just keep repeating these different types of, of situations until, you know, we learn, we do need stronger boundaries in place. We are lovable. We are worthy, all of these wonderful lessons. So as we wrap up, what do you want to make sure everyone knows? I want to make sure that, uh, women and men too, that everyone knows to be your own best friend. Um, Because if I had like found my voice and been able to counsel myself, like you would talk to your best friend, if they were describing this relationship to you, what would you say to them? Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. friends were definitely expressing concern um, regarding this last relationship that I'm describing. And we're saying, oh my goodness, Um, Are you okay? What's going on? Because I'm Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of pluses, but I'm seeing some really 
big flags um, also of his not introducing me to family and friends mm. um, was another, you know, another big flag. And again, um, you know, called him out on it, um, but just um, didn't, didn't get a change in, a change in behavior. Yeah. So, and, and I always say too, if you do have children, it's such a great, if you're not sure what to do, you put your kids in that situation. What would you tell them? And it becomes so clear what we would say. And, and, you know, because with them, we do anything. So why is it that we're so wonderful, so loving, so giving with our friends and with our kids? And we're not leaving much of that for ourselves, but a, a, good, exactly. a good case to do just We that. can just be too stingy with ourselves because we're too burned out. We're doing too much for other people. So we're not nurturing ourselves first. It's that, that analogy of do not serve other people from your teacup. Make sure mm -hmm. you're really filling up your own teacup yeah. by taking care of yourself in wonderful ways every day and serve them from the overflow, yeah. um, you know, so that you're just not, um, you know, just crunchy, crunchy fried. So just mm -hmm. really loving yourself first. Yes. And Lucille Ball said that um, there's a, a famous quote where she said, you know, basically said, said um, love yourself first and everything else will fall into place. Yeah. And she was so. right. She was right. So, you know what, it's, it's, it's so wonderful that you shared your experiences and we saw the path. And of course, what everybody sees every time and everybody hears every time they listen or watch the show, we go from that place of having that experience, going through the physical, mental, and emotional pain that gets associated with it. We uh, try to make sense of the senseless, but eventually we make meaning from it. And that's when we come out the other side. So Wendy, I want to thank you so much. Where do we go to learn more about you? You can go to my website, which is my full name, wendyrosewilliams.com, and be happy to um, offer people a complimentary 15-minute phone appointment to get to know them a little bit better. And just want to conclude and say, I think we need to change our culture to learn that we're meant to rise in love, not fall in love. Because there's something about that concept of falling in love that implies giving away your power. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really, really an issue. Oh, that's powerful. I love that. Okay. All right. You heard it, everybody. Wendy Williams sharing, uh, you know, the story of trauma to transformation, and she's living to tell about it. So that's wonderful. Wendy, thank you so much. And and I know there are so many listeners who, you know, they're, they're saying, oh my gosh, that's me. Uh, but in that, they can say, okay, well, Wendy pulled herself through, learned a tremendous amount of lessons, and I can too. So that Absolutely. Was, that's a wonderful gift that you gave the audience. So thank you so much. Thank you. As if the betrayal of someone you trusted wasn't hard enough to manage, when the betrayer has an affair with one of your close relatives, that's a whole other betrayal that needs to be healed too. It's all a lot to deal with, and that's why it's so common, almost impossible, to not have physical symptoms after a painful experience. Stay in touch with Wendy by going to wendyrosewilliams.com, and we'll have all of her information in the show notes at thepbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. I'm sure I've said this 10 times and it's worth repeating. The absolute worst thing to do after a relationship ends is to get into another one. The next relationship after one ends must be with yourself to see what needs attention, what needs healing, what beliefs need to be changed, what habits no longer serve, and so much more. When we rush into that new relationship, we can only create more of the same. So while temporarily there's that new relationship high, there's that inevitable low. Instead, use that time to give yourself what you truly need until you feel confident, healed, and strong. Then watch what happens. Like the show? Please subscribe, rate, and review. And of course, if you know of someone struggling to heal from a betrayal, be sure to tell them about the show. And if you haven't already, be sure to take the post-betrayal syndrome quiz, which you can find at the pbtinstitute.com forward slash quiz. And have you checked out the PBT Institute membership community? Imagine everything you'd ever need to become your physical, mental, emotional best. Community, support, certified coaches and practitioners you could schedule time with, daily classes on all kinds of interesting topics, curated experts teaching advanced strategies in the areas of health, mindset, spirituality, personal development. Imagine the most friendly, welcoming, and supportive place to become your best. 
all online. Nothing like this exists, and I am so excited to welcome you. Go to the pbtinstitute.com forward slash join to learn more. Thanks for listening. Can't wait to be with you next time, and here's to your breakthrough.